Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first event in a series of four Terra Lectures in American Art. This series is sponsored by the Terra Foundation for American Art, which is dedicated to fostering exploration, understanding, and the enjoyment of the visual arts of the United States for both national and international audiences. In collaboration with the Department of the History of Art at Oxford and Worcester College, the Foundation grants an annual fellowship to a leading scholar in American art. This year, Emily C. Burns is the Terra Visiting Professor for 2020-2021. My name is Wes Williams. I'm a professor in French and also the director of Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities here at the University of Oxford. And we are delighted to host this series, which has been included as part of the live online event series in the Humanities Cultural Programme, one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Center for the Humanities. Throughout this evening's lecture, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the YouTube chat box and we'll do our best to answer them as part of this session. <clears throat> I'm delighted that this lecture will be introduced and chaired by Professor Peter Gibeon. Peter, who teaches American literature and culture in the English department at McGill University in Montreal in Canada, where he has won four teaching awards. His publications include Mass Culture and Everyday Life and Oliver Wendell Holmes and the Culture of Conversation. So we should be in for a retreat tonight as we have all of those involved, conversation and also mass culture and everyday life. A fine person then to introduce today's lecture, not least because he's also worked on a wide range of writers and artists, done pioneering work in social and cultural spaces from shopping mall spectacles through to the experience of Flannery, wandering through the streets, roughly speaking, in 19th century shopping arcades and cosmopolitanism in 19th century American literature. Once you know what we're talking about this evening, you'll realize why he's one of the best people we could imagine to introduce tonight's lecture. And it's my great pleasure then to welcome Peter this evening and now, Peter, I'll hand over to you and disappear from your screens for now. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. And thank you. It was great to meet you at this time, actually. And thanks to all the people at Torch for setting up this event. I'd also like to thank uh, the Terra Foundation for their support for this lecture series, as well as for the visiting professor program that has brought Professor Emily Burns to Oxford for this year. It's a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to introduce Emily today and in the process um, to get reacquainted, kind of updated on uh, her work in a number of areas, very close to my own interests. In fact, one of the outstanding things about Emily's work is that it is so wide ranging in its implications and so can raise stimulating questions for a diverse range of audiences, bringing together visual arts, literature, cultural history, intellectual history, and so on and so on. Um, I first met Emily several years ago at a symposium in Utah um, in which she was testing out initial ideas about American art and innocence in fin de siècle Paris. Um, the ideas that broke the ground for this ambitious book project she will be lecturing about in this Torch series. So I, I am truly excited to be here today to see where she has taken those initial intriguing ideas. Emily is an Associate Professor of Art History at Auburn University and a scholar of transnational exchange in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Her publications include a book, Transnational Frontiers, the American West in France, University of Oklahoma Press, 2018, and a forthcoming volume co-edited with Alice Rudy Price, Ma Mapping Impressionist Painting in Transnational Contexts, which will be out this spring. She has also published journal articles, exhibition catalog essays, and anthology chapters related to art and circulation, to US artists in France, uh, to American Impressionism. During her tenure as the Tara Foundation for American Art visiting professor in the Department of History of Art at the University of Oxford and a visiting fellow at Worcester College, Professor Burns will complete a book manuscript from which today's talk comes, Performing Innocence, Cultural Belatedness 
and U.S. Art in Fin de Siècle, Paris. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Emily Burns. Thank you so much, Peter, for the kind introduction and for acting as moderator and discussant. My thanks as well to my wonderful colleagues and students here in the History of Art Department at the University of Oxford and Worcester College for hosting me this year. I also wanna thank Torch for managing the tech and making this lecture globally available. And of course, the Tara Foundation for American Art for generously funding this professorship. In 1891, London's Independent printed a series of comments by Canadian novelist Gilbert Parker about American art students in Paris. Parker initiated his discussion, one cannot feel the force of American aspiration in culture and art until one has seen art life in Paris. Four years earlier, the US expatriate writer Henry James made a similar claim in an article about fellow expatriate John Singer Sargent. It sounds like a paradox, but it is the simple truth that when today we look for American art, we find it mainly in Paris. Parker and James both imply that Paris became the unlikely staging ground for U.S. art in the fin de siècle, as U.S. artists arrived in waves building towards thousands per year over the decades between the U.S. Civil War and the start of World War I. Hoping to tap into a lucrative market for French painting in the United States, most U.S. artists took, undertook academic training at the École de Beaux-Arts or smaller private ateliers. This training was designed to build the artistic maturity suggested by Frederick Arthur Bridgman's glowing monumental history painting, Funeral of a Mummy on the Nile from the late 1870s, and by a photograph of Elizabeth Jane Gardner, who lived in Paris from the 1860s and later married French painter William Adolphe Bouguereau, who taught many US artists in Paris. Gardner pauses beside her painting of a Madonna and child, holding her brush, palette, and mall stick to demonstrate her careful hand control. Yet, by the late 1880s, backlash ensued about this aesthetic mirroring, with the New York Times declaring that Bridgman, quote, by method or subject or character in paint is not American at all. And with critic Theodore Child sneering that Gardner's paintings must be by Bouguereau rather than her own. In response to the feared adulteration of American art by French cultural hegemony, critics, writers, and artists increasingly leaned on persistent articulations of American cultural innocence. After suggesting that a main goal of modern art was to be naive, in his 1891 article, Parker mused, what command better suited to the American temperament? If it has any quality which is conspicuously eminent, it is naivete, it is a habit of looking at things as if they were seen for the first time. He persisted that the American sees things with no intervening veil of convention and tradition. He is bade to be independent and free from his youth up. He is impelled to think things out for himself. He is told in effect from his cradle to be naive. With these comments, Parker taps into and reinforces a longstanding myth about US culture as innocent and naive compared with European civilization. And while Parker's is a single text, as we will see, it is by no means singular. He is part of a chorus of constitutive commentaries, both celebratory and derisive during this period. Parker's comments tease out the paradoxes at work in such claims of knowing innocence and savvy naivete. Phrases like, bade to be independent and free, told to be naive, and his description of the habit of looking at things as if they're seen for the first time, mark this wily contradiction. Philosopher Immanuel Kant has noted that there is a farce within innocence. Since the definition of naivete is artlessness, an art of being naive, he says, is a contradiction. Likewise, the art historian John House has observed, quote, all ideas of naivete and the primitive are themselves cultural, not natural. The very concept of innocence presupposes knowledge. 
building on House's insistence that one historicize these quests for the, naiv the naivete and the primitive, this lecture series offers an intellectual history of the concepts of innocence, naivete, and artlessness that had currency for Americans in Funda Siècle Paris and explores how materiality, iconography, writing, and social performance intersected with this discourse. These layered representations in text, image, and dialogue resonate with the paradox of their very implausibility. The goal of these discussions is not to reify these myths or to call them back into currency, but rather first to show how the myth operates as fiction through intermediate iterations, and second, to show how cultural production, especially in the visual world, intercepted and became part of this transnational conversation. While much of this material is humorous, I encourage us to think with and through that humor to the anxieties beneath the surface of these exaggerated operations of parody, as US identity is perpetually questioned, contested, performed, and reinscribed through art making and criticism. Today, I will build a matrix of fluid interwoven and layered definitions of innocence that circulated in and about the US colony in Paris in art criticism in popular culture and literature by Mark Twain, Henry James and Edith Wharton and consider some of the so social philosophical and artistic implications of this construct and its currency. These discussions build on earlier debates about aesthetics in US literature. Mark Bauerlein has shown how Ralph Waldo Emerson projected the need not only for newness in literary content from quotes, new lands, new men, new thoughts, but also a new mode of expression. Nancy Rutenberg argued that antebellum literary practice imagined a personality for US poetry but in a paradoxically, and I'm quoting from her here, mandated prerequisite of inarticulateness for an authentic national poetic selfhood. Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, published in 1855, idealizes the US as a young country with no history. In Thoughts, Whitman extolled, how America illustrates birth, muscular youth, the promise, the sure fulfillment, the absolute success. Yet Rutenberg points out his posturing of what she calls an aesthetic of innocence, which he's announcing through his own um, description of his uh, indescribable freshness and unconsciousness. Pairing art and artlessness, he pointedly wrote, the art of art, the glory of expression and the sunshine of the letters is simplicity. This tension echoes in conversations about art praxis. In Funda Siècle Paris, US artists' attempts to gain technical maturity stumbled into longstanding debates about what the arts in a so-called young country should look like. If critics similarly expected a US art to emerge from perceived cultural innocence and the absence of art, what then were, style, or were artists' stylistic choices? Um, and further, if Bridgman and Gardner's quoting of gleaming glazed surfaces were not it, um, could there be an artless art? It is my contention that articulations of US cultural innocence in Paris asserted an anxious cultural scarcity in the sense of claiming absence of art in the so-called new world, but also a projection of US possibility, which inverted this critique to imagine what vacuity might offer to art making. Playing with these traits and their complexities in Paris, US artists, writers, and travelers projected their own belatedness. In other words, they collectively built a sense of American culture as comparatively behind, delayed, and not yet arrived. The ironic result, American studies scholar Bernd, Bernd Hensegenra has argued of constantly projecting a new sense of um, projecting a sense of newness and an obsession with futurity. In cultural production, Hensegenra suggests a circularity unfolds between tellings of history and of and of myth. Operating in a manner akin to what Griselda Pollock has called avant-garde gambits, Americans' performance of innocence in Paris functioned as a cultural gambit. Pollock describes a process of reference, difference, and, sorry, let me start that again. 
Pollock describes a process of reference, deference, and difference that characterized avant-garde production in Fonda Siècle Paris, where artists engage with and nod to previous artists and then distort and displace that model with their own intervention. This transnational dialogue operated in a similar feedback circuit. As French artists and critics came to imagine US belatedness, many individuals adopted and performed these ideas of cultural use reciprocally, but also dislodged them for cultural gain through repeated iterative performances in material production and social practice. With this theoretical and critical foundation, let's turn to sketching out the trajectory of this discourse and contextualizing the currency of these terms in constant refraction in Franco-US exchange. This late 19th and early 20th century conversation operates in dialogue with perhaps the original American innocent in Paris, Benjamin Franklin. Living in Paris from, 18, from 1777 until 18, 1785, clearly I'm stuck in the 19th century, Franklin became an icon of new world eccentricity. Then in his 70s, his bumbling French and refusal to adapt to the comportment of the French aristocracy by wearing his simple unembroidered cloak and appearing in court without makeup or wig rendered him charming and peculiar to French observers curious about the citizens of an incipient nation, a primitivist mirage, one scholar called him. French prints often present Franklin as a humble philosophe as in this image depicting him wearing spectacles and a fur wrapped around his head. A naive man in a sophisticated world, the image plays with stereotypes of the United States as an untamed wilderness and the fur trade which framed French presence in, the North, in North America for centuries. A print made in Philadelphia by Anton Hohenstein, Franklin's reception at the court of France, imagines Franklin sticking out as a curiosity in the midst of the French court as a woman places a laurel wreath over his wigless head, resulting in the rapt attention of and ears of King Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette, who are seated at right and lean towards him. The sumptuous fabrics and gowns and drapes juxtapose Franklin's simple dress, which cultivates the idea of the simple, humble, and pious American. Yet, Franklin's international personality is complex. While some fellow U.S. revolutionaries, such as John Adams, were critical of his lack of French skills, and some French observers saw through what one described as a chameleon persona, Franklin's character of savvy naivete deflected attention from his goals of persuading French monarchical support for the revolutionary cause. As Peter Gibeon has argued, Franklin's writings mark him as a key cosmopolitan figure um, for early Americans in his transnational mobilities. And while the influx of Americans in Paris came a century after Franklin's stay, reminders of that cultural history circulated through the publication in the 1880s of an extended two volume book, Franklin in France. The other important precursory voice for the circulation of these myths in Fin de Siècle Paris is Alexis de Tocqueville, whose Democracy in America, published in the 1840s, remained in print. While Tocqueville was often a shrewd critic of US racial politics, he also furthered ideas of national newness that French critics parroted when they made statements about Americans as anti-formulaic. Tocqueville described the American philosophical method as driven by the attempt to quote, escape from imposed systems, the yoke of habit, to treat tradition as valuable for information only and to accept existing facts as no more than a useful sketch to show how things could be done differently and better. Tocqueville pressed on the idea of Americans as enacting perpetual discovery and eschewing formulae, writing, no craftsman's axiom makes an, ever makes an American pause. He is not attached more to one way of working than to another. He has no preference for old methods compared to new one. He has created no habits of his own, and he can easily, easily rid himself of any influence foreign habits might have over his mind, for he knows that his country is like no other and that his situation is something new in the world. The specter of Tocqueville's assertions loom in the later century. 
Thomas Couture, a French painter who taught many American art students in Paris, remarked, for instance, in 1870, the American seems to hold the principle not to take what's offered to him. Going continually to discovery, he takes only that which he thinks he has discovered. U.S. writers in Paris later echoed Tocqueville's constructs too. In 1901, the American Register, which was the English language newspaper of the U.S. colony in Paris, advertised the American love of the new, um, which they described as the new, the untried, the unexplored, as one of the country's national peculiarities. Across the span of decades, these comments suggest a refractive feedback loop of cultural stere stereotype of a futurity that resulted in belatedness. In the art world, explicit discussions of US innocence and naivete began to appear around the end of the Civil War, concurrent with the first large wave of US artists traveling to Paris, where they became so numerous as to be called their own genus by the end of the century. Some of this rhetoric emerged in the early 1860s in the US. As Janice Simon, Simon has shown, the arts magazine, The New Path, encouraged artists to embrace their innate artlessness. Editor Clarence Cook celebrated that US artists are, quote, not hampered by too many traditions, and they enjoy the almost inestimable advantage of having no past, no masters, and no schools. Framing his conclusions with tropes of cultural youth, Cook wrote, these conditions of a childish simplicity and ignorance in matters of art, coupled with a strong and wide interest in such matters, albeit uninformed, untrained, and perceptions naturally direct and true are nowhere to be found today as pure as they are in America. Cook reshapes the liability, childishness, simplicity, ignorance, uninformed, untrained, of lacking art culture into an asset linked with fresh perception um, and even a suggested authenticity. On the eve of his departure to study in Paris in 1866, US painter Thomas Aikens wrote to his friend and fellow artist William Sartain, offering an etymology of the word naive, which arose from their debate about whether nature and art were diametrically opposed. Aikens noted that Sartain had privileged artless as central to the definition of naive. And Aikens agreed that humans tended to create a frequent contrast between nature and art, nature associated with the naive and art with careful control. Then Aikens identified related concepts to naivete, noting that they all emphasize things passively received. And he listed those terms, and in his actual letter, he offers a more detailed analysis of each one of them, um, but they are artless, unaffected, unassuming, open, sincere, unpretending, undisguised, candid, simple, unstudied, frank, unpremeditated, concluding there are, I suppose, many more. Aikens resolved and suggested his aesthetic priorities as he began training in Paris by arguing, quote, nature and art are but the same words. While Aikens and Sartain focused on whether nature and art were opposed or linked, US artists in, in France publicly debated these and other aspects of innocence and its contradictions. They wondered, for instance, how the same term could be used to define youth morality, and also heedlessness and recklessness. Robert Henry Riley observed that in Paris, quote, many things that in America would be the height of indecency occur about us with an innocence that is really amusing. Such discussions also reverberated um, back and forth between France and the United States. In 1895, this painting, I think this one, by Alion Perrault was removed from a dealer's window in Baltimore due to complaints about its propriety. Entitled Innocence, uh, the painting shows a nude young girl with a bow on her head, kissing a dove which she cradles in her arms. With the figure pressed up against the front of the picture plane and her body extended almost the full height of the canvas with only a thin gauzy veil stretching down in front of her pubic area, some Baltimore residents saw the painting as immoral in spite of its title and the girl's young age. That this painting of a nude could be so titled suggests differences in defining the term in France than in the United States. 
In France, Perrault's title likely drew from the youthful nature of the prepubescent figure veiled in modesty, whereas the painting's US detractors associated the scarcely veiled body with depravity. The response of the US community in Paris to the scandal fell between these fluctuating definitions, largely because of the painting's academic style. The writer for the American Register mused, consider the artist's very discreet and conventional treatment, and it would seem difficult to find anything in the most remote way suggestive. These contradictory positions around this epi episode um, implies a spectrum of complex ideas of innocence circulating in objects and in newspapers between Paris and the US. Discussion of these terms and their related meanings for nation and art speaks to a building currency in the post-Civil War period, um, especially in Paris. While debates about US cultural production had been going on since founding, overt claims to cultural innocence took on an urgency in this period, likely because it was a myth increasingly challenged by social realities. As James wrote in 1879, the Civil War marks an era in the history of the American mind. It introduced into the national consciousness a sense of the proportion and relation of the world being a more complicated place than it had hitherto seemed. The future more treacherous, success more difficult. The American has eaten of the tree of knowledge. James intimated that the Civil War incited a paradigm shift in US culture and self-perception. Knowing postures of innocence sought to remedy a nation shattered by war, failed reconstruction, divisive financial interests, unresolved racial politics, the genocide of indigenous populations, immigration, and urbanization. Uneasy projections of U.S. innocence resounded more loudly at precisely the moment when geopolitical events suggest its implausibility. And many U.S. artists, critics, and writers seem to be attempting to enact a kind of return, impossibly, to the idealism of Whitman. Mark Twain cracked about the contradiction of this perpetual renewal in 1883. The world and books are so accustomed to use and overuse the word new in connection with our country that we early get and permanently retain the impression that there is nothing old about it. Innocence also performs the cultural work of forgetting, othering, and obscuring imperialism. As critic Homi K. Baba has suggested, building on comments from this period by writers such as Ernst Renan, inscriptions of national character often enact a quote, strange forgetting of the history of the nation's past, the violence involved in establishing the nation's writ. In the US, innocence enacts amnesia to deny and obfuscate the histories of slavery and American Indian removal. Constructions of national newness obscured settler colonialism by reinforcing misconceptions that the landscape was empty when Anglo-European settlers arrived. Tocqueville, for instance, implied that the North American landscape was terra nullius, what he described as the still empty cradle of a great nation, a concept that was recycled by imperialists like Theodore Roosevelt, who reiterated the false narrative of the continent as little populated. Furthermore, as performance historian Robin Bernstein and Jungian psychologist Barry Spector have both argued, innocence requires an other. It insists upon the duality of being innocent from something or someone else. In this way, ideas of cultural innocence reinscribed race hierarchies. And finally, projections of cultural innocence deflected attention from US imperial ambition which were often played off in humor, such as in a comment in L'Illustration in 1881 that decried Americanization with the comment, the new continent is menacing us with their purely Yankee novelty. Or as Mrs. Tristam jokes to Christopher Newman in James is the American, you are the great Western barbar barbarian stepping forth in his innocence and might gazing a while at this poor, effete old world, and then swooping down on it. Innocence and might, an uneasy pairing that renders apparent this paradoxical position. Such resounding and exaggerated insistence reads as parody in Twain's The Innocence Abroad, which was published in 1869. Twain plays with the term innocence 
to refer to the gullibility of US travelers who make the pilgrimage to Europe. The book's frontispiece, The Pilgrim's Vision, which you see here, depicts its white male figures gazing dreamily into formations of key world monuments in the clouds, underscoring the possibilities enabled by imaginary, flexible, and unencumbered visions. There is an undergirding trope of US discovery turning back to Europe here. But more explicitly, the text caricatures tourists desperately seeking European culture, their grand tour filling a gap in their identity. Twain mocks his narrator in Paris, whose breath is taken away most by the sight of an American flag hanging in front of a house. In the next episode, the narrator guilelessly shouts to his companion about the beauty of a woman nearby, assuming she spoke only French. When she condemned his brashness in, quote, good pure English, he did not feel right comfortable for some time afterward. He ruminated, why will some people be so stupid as to suppose themselves the only foreigners among a crowd of 10,000 persons? Rendered by the New York company Fay and Cox and loosely based on Twain himself, the figure in the accompanying illustration is displayed as uncouth with his arms and legs splayed as though he is off balance. His eyebrows are raised, enhancing his wide-eyed, open-mouthed expression. His bowler hat renders him out of step with the chic stovepipe hat, stove hats that abound in the background. The figure marks a parody of American newness, especially compared with Hollier's rendering of Whitman. Here, the poet's tilted hat and hand are casually resting on his hips, both naturalizing allusions to the rustic common American man. He seems confident, assured, unencumbered. In comparison with his ignorance, Twain can't muster the persona of Whitman's new American man. And I'm interested to note that this transition also seems to play out in aesthetics too, if we think about the fine nuance of the stipple engraving that you see on the left in Hollier's print of Whitman compared with the gestural and frenetic lines that make up the engraving um, from The Innocence Abroad. U.S. guilelessness in international settings was often also expressed in monetized terms. In another scene from Innocence Abroad, Twain mocks attempts by American tourists to engage culture by visiting the Louvre, but who were thwarted by insistent guides who brought them to markets and silk shops instead. The illustration depicts the helpless tourists swept amid their protestations to the Silk Magasin by the tour guide who directs the coach driver. Twain concluded that this situation recurred frequently. It need not be supposed that we were a stupider or an easier prey than our countrymen generally are, for we were not. The guides deceive and defraud every American who goes to Paris for the first time and sees insights alone or in the company with others as little experienced as himself. Twain's humor maps the guilelessness of his main characters onto Americans as a whole, and this becomes the trope in succeeding decades. I'll just show you one quick example. In 1892, Corwin Linson described a cab driver knowingly charging one franc too much from American art students arriving in Paris. In Linson's illustration, he renders the driver almost demonic with his cinder goggles gleaming as he stretches his palms out toward the viewer for the coins. And I apologize if this image gives anyone nightmares. A Parker Brothers board game, The Amusing Game of Innocence Abroad, released in 1888, invited players to imagine themselves as one of Twain's tourists. And it also reveals some of the strange contours of this discourse of cultural innocence and travel. On the cover of the box, a family hurriedly transfer across a dock from a train to the steamboat, the Port Washington. Yet, this boat looks more like a riverboat than a transatlantic ship, and the view across the water renders close the opposite side. The travelers overladen with bags as they scuttle across the dock do not seem to travel far. With generic titles, the board also does not define any particular place, and there's no monuments or cities one would normally find on a grand tour, unlike uh, the current game Ticket to Ride, which has very specific destinations. Here, the player remains scarcely abroad, traveling within the safe confines of an accessible, unplaced landscape. 
In the game, two pawns uh, migrate the chromolithographic board simultaneously, one through the pastoral landscape at the bottom and right, and the other through the possible outcomes of traveling, um, which are mostly pretty benign, purchasing slippers or tooth powder, and most drastically losing one's wallet. The winner makes it through the landscape the most quickly, but having spent the least amount of money, Twain's and Vincent's images and this game elevate a kind of anxiety of encountering the world outside the safe confines of the nation and draw particular attention to financial duress as a key danger of travel. In these iterations, the guileless American is no match for the savvy European. James's characters have a better shot. Ever attuned to what he described as the international theme, James was unsatisfied with the simplistic projection of a stifling and constrictive American guilelessness. He instead sought increasingly an artlessness that could be freeing for his US travelers abroad, offering a kind of fortunate fall from a position of innocence, even by embracing its very tenets. While Kant rejected the concept of artful naivete, he also wrote that there is, quote, certainly the possibility of presenting naivete in a fictitious character, and then it is a fine, though also rare, art. This seems a fitting gauntlet for James's writing. From Daisy Miller of 1878 to the Ambassadors of 1903, James's characters exhibit a qualified innocence. In Daisy Miller, Daisy's own guilelessness is complicated by Winterborne's awareness of her projection of innocence as a knowing social posture. He muses about the moonlit excursion that led Daisy uh, to catch Roman fever and die. Oops, there you go. What a clever little reprobate she was and how smartly she feigned, how promptly she sought to play off on him a surprised and injured innocence. From here, James builds an increasingly complicated trope of innocence. He, in 1902, offered a lengthy discussion on this theme. The dawn of the American consciousness to the complicated world it was so persistently to annex is the more touching, the more primitive we make that consciousness. But we must recognize that the latter can scarcely be interesting to us in proportion as we make it purely primitive. The self-reflection places James's project as centered on an awakening of US culture to its naive position. And it also builds an imperialist tone through annexation of com commandeering that world. But guileless isn't enough for James, who continues, the interest is in its becoming perceptive and responsive, and the charming, the amusing, the pathetic, the romantic drama is exactly that process. The process must have begun in order to determine the psychological moment, but there is a fine bewilderment it must have kept in order not to anticipate the age of satiety. James notes his goals to move beyond simplistic dichotomies between innocence and experience to a qualified innocence in which a layered naivete could awaken the spirit. In the later novel, The Ambassadors, James entangles at least five different concepts of innocence, almost all of them tied to mobility. There is the newness projected by Lambert Strether when he arrived overseas with the goal to disentangle his fiance son's Chad from his Parisian life. Playing with ideas of youth uh, then in his mid fifties, Strether notes, quote, he had never expected again to find himself young. He also described feeling his quote, sense of self launched in something quite disconnected from the sense of the past and which was literally beginning there and then. Innocence is also framed in Strether's propriety with his insistent perception of Chad's relationship with the married Madame de Vionnet as innocent. As in Daisy Miller, innocence operates through exterior social performance as Strether scrutinizes the possible romance between Chad and de Vionnet, um, probing whether, quote, their art were all an innocence or their innocence were all an art. James also took up artlessness as Strether in Paris becomes increasingly unencumbered, giving himself over to quote, uncontrolled perceptions. 
The denouement of the book is framed by yet another kind of artlessness through wandering. On a rambling day, Strether attempts to be artless as he takes a train out of Paris, selected almost at random with a destination chosen by instinct. And interestingly, this is also how US artists in Giverny describe initially finding the village um, in the 1880s. James narrates these scenes with languid and wandering language that parallels the experience of the character. Strether walks idly through the landscape um, alongside a river, resting lazily in the fields, imagining himself, and I quote again from James, freely walking about, and he's inside a painting by Emile Charles Lambinet that he recalled from a Boston art gallery on Tremont Street. James toys with the tension between the artfulness of walking inside a painting and the artlessness that framed the day. Or as literary scholar Zachary Seeker puts it, quote, artless enough, and yet Strether's conception of the French countryside is wholly conditioned by art. And I want to linger um, with you in this passage. James leads us in and out of the quote, oblong gilt frame that disposed its enclosing lines, the poplars and willows, the reeds and river, a river of which he didn't know and didn't want to know the name, fell into a composition full of felicity within them. The sky was silver and turquoise and varnish. The village on the left was white and the church on the right was gray. It was all there in short, it was all he wanted. It was Tremont Street, it was France, it was Lambinet. James's language remingles nature and art as Aiken sought to do in his deep dive on the naive. In the sky of silver and turquoise and varnish, perceptions of color dissolve into material and matter eliding painting as represented scene and as material surface. Strether's ambling opens him to self-discovery as he saunters along, quote, a river which set one afloat almost before one could take up the oars, the idle play of which would be moreover the aid to the full impression. Strether breaks free from his stilted identity, the flow of the river current taking control. As this current carries a rowboat with Chad and Vionnet, and Strether understands finally the romantic nature of their relationship, he quote, recognized at last that he had really been trying all along to suppose nothing. Verily, verily, his labor had been lost. He found himself supposing innumerable and wonderful things. Strether's artless ramble through the countryside forces him to move through his self-imposed naivete. In Strether, James designs a complex and awakening form of naivete that replaces guilelessness with something that is creative and personally generative, a possibility that is enabled by stepping into the liminal space between art and innocence. James's contest between these entangled, even paradoxical ideas of innocence, that fine bewilderment, frames the layers of US projections of naivete in Paris. Edith Wharton also played with the paradoxical nature of deliberate claims to innocence. Recalling cosmopolitan New York in the 1870s from 1920 in the age of innocence, protagonist Newland Archer responds to his fiance May Welland, highlighting the uneasy nature of the quote, hieroglyphic world where the real thing was never said or done or even thought, but only represented by a set of arbitrary signs. Wharton builds a semiotics of innocence. When he had gone the brief round of her, he returned discouraged by the thought that all this frankness and innocence was only an artificial product. Untrained human nature was not frank and innocent. It was full of the twists and defenses of an instinctive guile. And he felt himself oppressed by this creation of factitious purity, so cunningly manufactured. As in James's late work, Wharton stresses the contradictory and constructed postures behind candid innocence. Like Kant, Wharton questions the possibility of true native innocence. She registers instead human nature as naturally riddled with instinctive guile. 
Together, comments in critical discussion alongside these larger narrations by Twain, James, and Wharton of the uh, uh, American innocent structure interwoven definitions of innocence that raise questions about interior and exterior selves, materiality and imagery, the simple and the complex that reverberate in the American community in Paris. The semiotics of innocence as projected and tried on for size fundamentally shaped Franco-US artistic dialogue in the Second Empire and Third Republic. At stake in these gambits was partly the question of what the United States could contribute to an international art world. For some, cultural belatedness enabled the freedom of eclectic selection, as Tocqueville had also opined. James wrote of this future amalgamation in a letter in 1867, to have no, inter no national stamp has hitherto been a regret and drawback, but I think it not likely that American writers may yet indicate that a vast intellectual fusion and synthesis of various national tendencies of the world is in the condition of more important achievements than any we have seen. Paul Cedillo, the architect who had designed the Printon department store in Paris, likewise elevated synthesis when he honored Beaux-Arts architect Richard Morris Hunt at an award dinner in 1893 by suggesting that the youth of US art made it like a honeybee, collecting nectar from around the world, which he said would, quote, taste of the future with marvels of art young and new. Sadil celebrates selective amalgamation enabled by the purported blank slate in Hunt's eclectic and layered engagements with European architectural traditions, such as that seen in the Italianate Marble House at Newport and the neo-Gothic French-inspired Chateau of Biltmore in North Carolina. Others proposed that such a synthetic model would not suit, and instead argued that US artists could contribute an artless art by building on what academic painter Walter Gilman Page described as native crudeness. While French critic A. Malespin maligned the parsimonious American contributions to the universal exposition of 1867, which were a cottage and a rural schoolhouse um, and an Illinois bakery. Uh, and they were paltry submissions in part um, due to government disorganization following the Civil War. Um, but Malaspin concluded that they represented um, what he described as humble cabins whose grandeur is entirely moral. For in the middle of these riches in the fair around, which are dead, they symbolize the birth of the future. For Malaspin, these structures transform the absence of grandeur into an advantage, as well as a harbinger of future aesthetic of simplicity and morality. Although I should add that the late and very missed Francois Brunet has suggested that Malaspin was actually funded by the US to make such a complimentary statements. Um, but Malaspin is not alone in this uh, uh, commentary. Uh, French artist, art critic André Michel observed in 1886 that with their retained attachment to nature, US artists in France possessed a quote, candor, a naive sincerity that all the skill of our most talented virtuosos will never attain. They bring us an innocence of expression, a vigorous and honest simplicity that captivates, charms, and calms us. Gilbert Parker also took up this thread when he wrote about the naivete of American artists in Paris as a contribution to modernism. Implicit in these ideas is the expectation of French cultural decline. Uh, Parker claims that French art was limited in its quest for naivete because of what Parker saw as an ennui, a morbidness in the brain, which comes from overfed imaginations. So kind of uh, fueling a discourse of decadence. For Parker, French artists were overburdened with the weight of history and tradition, whereas US cultural youth was comparatively unencumbered. And in this discussion, longstanding presumptions of US innate artlessness collided with modernism's search for renewal. Whether a cultural blank slate enabled a eclectic accrual in original ways or a projection of an artless visual language, these tropes of innocence in Paris designed a US art as pristine, but also sterile, fresh, but also undeveloped, rugged, but also savage, and childlike, but also childish. 
the next two or three lectures will explore how US artists working in Paris capitalized on these entangled definitions of innocence in both aesthetic and social practice as they navigated foreign art study through other discourses of the period, including Protestantism and work ethic, race, and modern psychology. In closing, I'll note that the United States was by no means the only country that adopted belatedness strategically. Rather, this case is part of a larger rhizome of multiple and alternative modernisms and temporalities that scholars are increasingly tracing in the age of nationalism. A study day I'm planning for later this spring will invite wider analysis of belatedness in modernity, such as that presented by settler artists in colonial Australia, Wassily Kandinsky's interests in Russian ethnography and folk art, returns to handcraft production in the arts and crafts movements in Britain, the US and in Russia, alongside projections of belatedness which were imposed as colonial export. While paradoxical in claim and speaking to a discourse of exceptionalism, US projections of belatedness in France were also not entirely unique. Thank you for your attention and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a very loaded lecture, you know, a loaded 50 minutes. You sketched a, a wide sweep of history and you gave a, a lot of thought provoking case studies that should stimulate a lot of questions. And we do have some questions already coming in. Um, keep those questions and comments coming in um, as we talk. But, um, and one of the, the first questions is, is something that touches on my sort of first question, kind of, a, but it's from Jane. And, and she said, there must be evidence of the actual talents of some American art students. You know, the, the, what actual seriously, uh, you know, working uh, American art students were doing in Paris. And I would add my sort of my question on top of that, the sort of what are, what would you say the artists are? It seems such a, a paradox of your talk. What are the art students looking for in a trip to late 19th century Paris? Are they looking for um, tr training, um, learning, uh, about you know traditional techniques and traditional crafts and conventions of past art, or are they, as you say, really interestingly, going to Paris for cultural rejuvenation? Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, like which would mean, in a way, um, going to Paris to perform their innocence. You know, how, how how are they doing both of those things? But Jane wanted to know really what, and I know you you have a lot of anecdotes about this, but you know, what were actual artists? doing in Paris? Why, were, why did they have to go to Paris to discover, rediscover their pre-Civil War innocence? Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Jane and Peter, for that question. Yeah, no, there's lots of evidence of what artists are producing and tremendous bodies of work survive from uh, everything from sketches that are made in the ateliers and academies to hundreds, maybe even thousands of paintings that are exhibited in the French salon system. And part of the draw of going to Paris for art making is that um, admission to the Ecole is free if you can pass the test to go and train. Um, and there's also a kind of flood of foreign artists coming from many other parts of the world to convene in this space as well. And so there is um, a, a kind of access to resources that is um, kind of more professionalized and more firmly established and an exhibition system too that operates as a kind of machine that artists want to participate in. Um, but one of the things that is um, really complicated in this history is that so many of the US artists are going to Paris not intending to stay. They see it as a kind of rite of passage uh, and an opportunity to gain skills that they can then employ when they return to the United States. And much of the focus on US artists in Paris is typically on the artists who did stay, who did integrate more fully in the cosmopolitan networks like Sargent and Whistler and Cassatt. Um, but I think that for the rest of the artists who are are going in this kind of rite of passage way, um, this kind of play of, of rejuvenation and a play of innocence is about kind of safeguarding a cultural identity that, that they will then carry back with them um, to the US. 
um, I think that's only a partial answer to your question, but um, I think that the, the other thing that pulls this question of rejuvenation together for me is that it's not just artists who are going, it's writers, it's um, tourists, um, and there are also a lot of people who expatriate to Paris because it's a lot more inexpensive to live there um, in this time period, you have a kind of higher quality of life. And so there is, I think, so much attention to Paris as this kind of site for projecting American identity in part because the colony is uh, like uh, varying in size permanently between kind of eight and 10,000 people, but it's really visible. Um, and so, uh, across art and um, kind of writing um, and the development of um, their own newspapers. Um, there's a lot of kind of self-refraction that is happening in that space. This, I, I, we just got a question in that I think might be a nice uh, piggyback on, on what we're already discussing, but from uh, Leah, um, how does the idea of this innocence performed in, in Paris uh, maybe relate to American collectors? in the late 19th century, art collectors who are acquiring artwork uh, throughout Europe, but uh, in Paris. Yeah, no, that's another great question. And I think that, um, so the other impetus for going to Paris is that the biggest collectors in the US after the Civil War are buying French academic painting. And so I think there's a hope that these art students will attain that system of painting and then find a market for their work when they return. Um, and so, there is um, definitely an uh, interest in kind of trying to capitalize on that possibility. But the other thing that this research has uncovered, and we'll talk more about this next week, is that there was a really close imbricated relationship between U.S. businessmen who were also art collectors in Paris in the 1890s especially and the U.S. art community. They were funding the artist clubs that uh, were formed in that decade. They were commissioning U.S. artists in Paris to make advertisements for their businesses um, and so there is a kind of close connection there that um, not only fuels the possible market for art but also kind of enables um, continued cultural practice um, in Paris. And uh, there's a lot of commentary in the 1890s, especially about how there's enough of an infrastructure there that going to Paris is like going to the United States because you can navigate these systems that are put in place um, with, without really having to um, interact or um, find yourself in the French milieu, except perhaps in the uh, atelier. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that, that would fit in with a, a Jamesian trope of certain kinds of American business people who go abroad and never leave home, uh, really. But I think that, but then I think the questioner was partly asking, you know, aren't, aren't these uh, people, after, uh, although they may be living in that American bubble, um, that, they, uh, that they're buying European art? And is there something, you know, is, 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 isn't, is that, um, you know, felt you know, sort of uh, going against this myth of innocence or is that is that some in some ways actually another another form yeah, um, that's a great yeah. question i think i think it's layered uh peter for example one of the probably the favorite painting in the louvre in this period is morio was Immaculate Conception. So many people write about it in their letters, in their diaries, and um, there is this um, interest in the picture, I think, as a representative of kind of simple piety. Um, and that's, those are the kind of themes that people are looking for in the European painting of the period, and it, at least it's in centered around that picture. And so I think that interest is um, indicative of the ways in which um, many of these individuals are, are being quite selective about what, what European source material they're wanting to engage with um, as they kind of dip into this cultural space. Um, but two, I think the, and this gets back, I think, to uh, our first question as well. I'm really interested in the kind of language of discovery that gets employed for discussing travel in France and the the ways in which that is producing or reproducing a kind of exploration narrative that earlier had been so focused on the borderlands of the US going to the West. Same kind of mantra, especially again in the 1890s, gets mapped back over to Europe in a way that um, I think is about building this exploratory discovery 
uh, position, um, but it also is imperialist. Mm -hmm. That might relate to, a, just as a comment, that, that your very interesting uh, move at the end when you talked about Henry James and his uh, idea of, of a way in which a lack of a native artistic tradition, cultural tradition, perceived lack, um, could actually lead not to an emphasis on present tense newness, but to a kind of a knowing um, approach to the wider world. A kind of, you know, a kind of a, a, a you know, an opening up, sort of like a, 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 the American, um, un, unlike the Italian who's caught in Italian culture and the Frenchman who's caught in French culture, whatever, you know, that that the American is is somehow freed a little bit mm -hmm. by this lack of cultural tradition, but not to become uh, an innocent, but to become a kind of aesthetic cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, exactly. That's the word that was sticking out to me as you were just speaking, Peter, that it makes me think about your work on kind of traveling culture and the ways in which um, it's easy for us to, to trace the threads of a kind of trope of Americanness if we're talking about U.S. literature in the U.S. But in, if we look at this kind of circulating, um, writers who are circulating or writing about people who are circulating, we can also find this aesthetic that is kind of inflecting this ingenuousness with a cosmopolitan um, energy. Kind of a, a knowledge of, of uh, multiple cultures and the multiplicity of cultures and uh, about trans uh, tr the dynamics of international, you know, mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin is, is also an example of this. But I wanted to, there, there are also a couple of questions um, uh, related to gender. Okay. Yeah. That, that I think might be really interesting here. And uh, so one of them is, uh, uh, we're really having some interesting uh, dialogue here, um, Tricia. Um, yeah, so was the idea of innocence, uh, naivete performed by American women artists in the late 19th century? Sorry, will you just say the first part of that again, Peter? I think it's like... what, what, what did, did uh, was the idea of this, uh, um, you know, this performed uh, innocence or performed naivete also something that was seen in, in American women artists in the Yes. Thank you. That's such a great question. And we're going to talk a lot about that next week. So whoever asked, I hope you'll come back. Um, but um, yes. Uh, and I think that the situation for women is particularly interesting because the there are estimates that about a third of the artists who went to Paris to train in this period were women. Um, and so we have a lot of women artists who are going to France. Um, but but I, I, my sense is that women are also kind of put in a bind in the sense that this trope of innocence uses the kind of impressionable uh, female flower as a metaphor for larger anxieties about American culture getting absorbed into French culture. And so as they become kind of allegorized in this international exchange, and like there's another uh, book by, I think it's William Dean Howells, The Lady of the Aristook, um, where the main character Lydia um, kind of goes abroad and um, has this like flirtation on the ship. And it's as much about this character as it is this speaking through this anxiety about American culture kind of losing its Self. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about women in France having access to the nude, um, having access to kind of uh, bohemian society. Um, there is a woman named Mrs. John Sherwood who wrote a few articles in the 1890s in which she articulates this kind of what I call a hysterical hyperbole, where she says 11,000 virgins annually cross the Atlantic. And so there is this kind of commentary that is kind of floating around. And I, my sense is that it, it challenges women artists who are going abroad because it kind of deprofessionalizes them by implying that they will be more likely to be subsumed into this um, trope or into this kind of bohemian life. And so um, there are artist clubs that are formed in the 1890s, both for men and women, but the clubs for women are uh, tend to kind of, again, deprofessionalize, even as they have exhibition spaces, they focus on lodging so that women are protected. Um, and there's also, and this is something we'll talk about next week too, a large Protestant community in Paris. Um, and the chapel that they built that we'll talk about, um, I was just reading recently letters by a woman who worshiped there. And she comments often in her letters that it's mostly women who are attending uh, the chapel there. And so I think that that, um, 
there are ways in which women are um, kind of caught up in this discourse in different ways, but then there's also ways in which they are um, kind of pushing back against these tropes in really interesting ways that, and I'll, I'll talk more about that next week too. Yeah. But that talking about this as a discourse, a gendered discourse and, and a series of tropes uh, leads to another question from um, Kamori that, you know, you may say that uh, you don't you don't have any information to bring us on this subject, but I think it's very interesting and relevant. What are your thoughts on Nabokov's Lolita and young American innocence versus uh, the older European um, uh, perspective and expectations? Um, it, uh, you know, is, is, is Nabokov an interesting example of the survival of this same uh, discourse? Discourse. Well, you have suggested a book that now I need to go read <laughs> because I've not read it, but I have looked, uh, there's a really wonderful um, book that I, I find really compelling written by Paul Giles called Virtual Americas. And it's about this transatlantic um, literary tradition in the 20th century. And I know that Nabokov is one of his big case studies in that text. But I'm interested in the way that he thinks about the idea of the virtual as a way to think about um, a kind of demystifying myth. And that we, if we think about transnational refraction, um, he describes it as a kind of elliptical structure, whereby doing comparative studies, we see that um, uh, stereotypes are kind of flattening, but then we end up with this kind of elliptical shape if we compare um, cultural perspectives. Um, and so I think that um, he will likely delve into that question in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I wondered if, and this might go back, I, I think one possible source for the Lolita dynamic and trope and discourse uh, might be Daisy Miller. Henry James, James's Daisy Miller. And in that work, I think you, you, know, you make good use of it. Um, it's a very interesting example for you, sort of anticipating the late 19th century issues you deal with, but they do, there is a, a Winterborn who's an example of an American, but who is sort of paralyzed by his internalization of European traditions and codes, et cetera. And then there's Daisy Miller, the, the woman uh, American, who is, uh, you know, the, the figure of a weird kind of vulgar, you know, untaught, um, unformed um, innocence. Uh, but also, you know, sort of a mythic innocence, but also a performer of innocence. So does that, you know, how would that uh, um, play out in that, you know, that same discourse? Yes, I think so. And um, yeah, I think that James is really rich for building these characters that are kind of already abroad and the ways in which they're um, sort of partially shaped by that experience, but then the kind of personalities that they try to retain. Um, the, uh, I think this also anticipates lectures to come in the series, which is a good thing. Um, John has a question about uh, switching to uh, race. Mm -hmm. And I actually wondered too, you said that uh, you had a, a, a statement about uh, the way um, innocence reinscribes racial hierarchies. Mm -hmm. But John asks a question, how did black artists burdened in the US by racist assumptions that their naivete demonstrated ignorance not promise or perceptiveness, navigate debates over the innocence of US artists in Paris. Thanks, John, that's a great question. And I hope you come in two weeks time uh, because that will be a kind of fundamental question um, of um, the discussion. Um, one of the things that I've uncovered in this research um, is that um, the big US Artist Club in Paris, the American Art Association had an annual minstrel show, a blackface uh, performance to raise money to um, fund the club's activities and, and exhibitions. And I'm really interested in thinking about how that performance performance participates in this larger trajectory in building ideas for French observers that expect um, African Americans and Native Americans to be primitive um, in compared with white Americans. Um, and I think that is part of the reason that this is starting to happen in the US colony. But the other half of that story is about um, the arrival of Black artists who begin to work in Paris, um, especially in the 1890s um, and early 20th century, like Henry Osawa Tanner, um, Meta Vaux Warwick Fuller, um, 
uh, William Harper as well. Um, and so I'm really interested in thinking about how they intersect with um, not only ideas about race, but also ideas about innocence. And um, I'm also going to be looking at the exhibit of American Negroes that was in the Paris Exposition in 1900, and the ways in which even as that exhibition is building a, a narrative of black culture that is all about kind of progress and incipience and uh, cultural youth, um, that that narrative is of course countering the racist stereotypes of, of caricature in, in minstrelsy, but it's actually replacing it with a narrative that fuels the larger narrative about US culture in Paris. And so we'll look more at those intricacies and complexities um, in two weeks. I think we're kind of um, we're kind of getting near the end, but we have a time. Uh, there are a lot of questions <laughs> that are coming in now, which is a great sign. Um, but um, but maybe we have time for one more or one and a half more or something like that. But um, uh, from Zach is this um, something that uh, actually I'm not sure if it does preview preview a future lecture. But um, could you sketch briefly, ask Zach how this dynamic perhaps played out uh, for Americans in other European cities. Mm. He says like Rome or Florence or. or yeah, you know. that's a great question. Um, and certainly there are a lot of US artists who are working in Rome a little earlier in the century. Some artists who are working in London um, earlier and also kind of concurrently. Um, and I, trying to think about Rome, there are certainly ways in which these kinds of anxieties about European culture merging um, come through. I'm thinking about like the, the Marble Fawn um, by Nathaniel Hawthorne, imagining artists in Rome. Um, one of the th other things we'll look at next week are artist studios in Paris. And um, Hawthorne creates a kind of studio of kind of seclusion and hermeticism in Rome to kind of protect the US artist from the kind of bohemian morales around him. Um, and so I think that discourse is a bit restaged there as well. Um, and I'm also thinking about Roderick Hudson to the other um, James novel where the character goes abroad and um, kind of uh, in the line of Daisy Miller kind of falls into this um, personality. Um, and the other thing that's coming to mind is actually not from this period, but from the late 18th century, when Copley is working in London, Emily Bellew Neff has done some really interesting work about Copley in London and suggested the ways in which Copley is very aware of international perceptions of a US attachment to nature and a kind of primitivist mentality. And she thinks that he is quite savvy in cultivating that in different ways um, as he's navigating the London art world. And that's an interesting case too, because as in the US colony in Paris, there's not a direct equation between the discourse of this um, kind of naive culture and the art that's produced. I think it plays through in more complicated ways. And also for Copley, who's painting these incredibly mature um, academic paintings. Um, yeah. So. Um so, so as an amalgamation of, of, of a few other questions, some people had a, as, maybe as a, as a capstone also that um, there, there were questions about the concept of um, the, the central concept of belatedness. I don't know that you didn't, um, you know, that it, um, came in and out of the lecture, but you know, but I think it's it's central to the book. It's the title of the book. But this and the, the question of um, whether and maybe you could unpack it or expand upon it just as, as, at the end here. But it seems um, the opposite of innocence in mm -hmm. some ways. If, as you say, um, in a, the cultural work performed by the myth of innocence is forgetting. Mm -hmm. and, kind of a denial of history, but belatedness sounds like, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a concept that involves a, a, a great uh, anxious awareness of history. You know, like it's all been done before. I feel, you know, the weight of all the past achievements in history. There's room, no room for anything new. So, you know, I'm again, kind of paralyzed by my awareness of everything that's gone before, you know, so that different kind of, that's the weird idea about, you know, an artist paralyzed by belatedness. Mm -hmm. um, but, and you're, you're making it, you're describing it as a, as a different thing, I guess, mm -hmm. but it is 
it does it does create get into that paradox about history and the forgetting of history. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's really great, and I I, I will definitely think more about this. But I think that. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about how this kind of obsession with the new and obsession with a kind of uh, structure of innocence creates this idea that a culture has not emerged yet. Um, and I do think that there is tremendous anxiety and in literary studies, but also in the history of art uh, in this period about um, kind of American cultural production. Um, and so I think that in the same way that innocence as a projection is a paradox, belatedness and innocence also operate in a kind of paradoxical relationship. Um, and there is, um, I think uh, like a, I, I think one thing I want to, to think through more is the question of how temporality is operating within both of those concepts, um, history and kind of ahistoricism, um, as well as um, innocence and, and experience. Yeah, great. You, you really probed some, you know, just a number of very fascinating paradoxes, innocence and performance we didn't even get to, but I'm sure you'll get to later, uh, innocence and sexuality, mm -hmm. uh, not gender, but with that, that painting, you know, that there could be an innocence in Walt Whitman or Daisy. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. But, uh, but there's room for more because this is not the end of the conversation, but I am getting messages that, that this does look like um, uh, we're out of time. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Emily one last time for her very uh, provocative, thought-provoking lecture this evening and to Torch again for hosting uh, this event tonight. And a big thank you also to the audience members at home for watching and for participating in a lively discussion, sending in your questions and so on. So I'm sorry that we weren't uh, able to answer all of the questions, but as I said, the conversation continues. Um, I'm looking forward to the next installment. So Emily will be exploring related issues in the lectures to follow. Um, please do join us for next week's event, the second in this four part Tara lecture series, which will take place on Wednesday, 24th February at 5 p.m. UK time. Uh, Emily will be joined by Wanda Korn, the Robert and Ruth Halprin Professor Emerita of Art History at Stanford University for that second lecture. Um, so we hope you will be able to join us again, everyone, next week. Uh, and thanks again. Uh, to, thanks to all once again for watching today, for the great lecture, and um, goodbye for now. <laughs>